Overcoming fear is something that, that encompasses our entire life. It's all around us, but yet it's not something that Christ wants us to live in. And so if you have your Bibles with you this morning, you can open up to 1 Samuel chapter 21, 8 through 15. I want to look through a story in the life of an individual by the name of David. Um, he was the king of Israel. And I want us to look at what does it look like to overcome fear and give you some practical steps that we can apply to our life. Here's how the, the Bible reads this morning. It says that this, it says, David was at, David asked Ahimelech, don't you have a spear or a sword here? I haven't brought my sword or any other weapon because the king's mission was urgent. The priest replied, the sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Eli, is here, and it's wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you want it, take it. There is no sword here but that one. David said, there is none like it. Give it to me. And it goes on and it reads, that day David fled from Saul and went to Achish, king of Gath. But the servants of Achish said to him, isn't this David the king of the land? Isn't he the one that, that they sing about in their dances? Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. David took these words, words to heart and look what it says. And he was very much afraid. He was very much afraid of Achish, king of Gath. So he pretended to be insane in their presence. And while he was in their hands, he acted like a madman, making marks on the doors of the gates and letting saliva run down his beard. He is so afraid that David is acting insane. He's a madman, making marks on the doors of the gate and letting saliva run down his beard. Achish said to his servants, look at the man. He is insane. Why bring him to me? Am I so short of madmen that you have to bring this fellow here to carry on like this in front of me? Must this man come into my house. Let us pray this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. I thank you for your presence and your Holy Spirit, God, that is already in this place, Lord, because God, you have shown up, Lord, to touch our hearts and our lives. God, as we open your word today, God, may it bring life to us, God. May we understand it in a way that we've never seen it before. And God, today, God, I pray, God, over the spirit of fear, God, that may be resting upon somebody, God, I pray, Lord, that it would be broken in the name of Jesus and that we would find freedom in Christ. In your name we pray, amen and amen. See, when it comes to life, there's what we can uh, classify as a good type of fear and a negative type of fear. You see, the good kind of fear is that, that kind of fear that you have that says, hey, I shouldn't walk down this dark alley at night because I don't know what lurks around the corner. A good type of fear is the kind of fear that says, you know what? I'm about ready to do something really stupid and I probably shouldn't do this because it has the ability to kill me. It has the ability to hurt me. It has the ability to injure me. That when we go through life that there is sometimes a good type of fear that keeps us from danger, that keeps us from hardships, that, that keeps us from trouble. But not only is there a good type of fear, there's also what we could term this morning a negative fear. And this negative fear is the type of fear that keeps you from stepping into the destiny that God has for your life. It's the type of fear that keeps you from, from taking steps of faith that God is calling you to take. It's the type of fear that maybe keeps you from entering into a relationship or staying in a relationship that you shouldn't be in. There's this negative type of fear that we often experience in life. And what we have to understand about this fear is that it's often a, a learned experience. It's a learned fear. When you think about a child or if you have ever given birth to a, to a child and they've been in your home, what we understand about babies is, is they have no fear to start with. I mean, they're the individuals that, that will touch the hot stove or, or stand on the back of a couch or, or move to an area. Why? Because they've never learned any fear in their life. A couple years ago, we, we went to uh, an indoor water park, and, and we went on vacation, and, and Jackson was at this indoor water park at the time. I think he was about five, and, and me and Landon were riding. My oldest son were riding all these rides, and, and I told Jackson, I was like, hey, why don't you go down this water slide with us? And he looked at me, and he was like, kind of shook his head, and I was like, come on, bud, it'll be fun. Until, until we went down the slide, it was no longer fun for him. 
And he all of a sudden was gripped with this fear. And, and the next day we're going to another water park. He's like, but let's go down this slide. It's just like a kiddie slide. I couldn't get him to go down like a little tyke slide that had like three steps. Because he had all of a sudden been gripped by fear because in one moment he learned a fear that began to shape his perspective of, of heights and, and other things in life. You see, there's all of these things that end up happening in our life that are learned fears. For some of you, you learn fear because of the home that you grew up in. And maybe your p- parents modeled fear for you. Like you grew up in a home where it's like you couldn't go outside to play because they were afraid you were going to scrape your knees or you couldn't go on the playground because they were afraid that you were going to get hurt or that you were going to fall off. And and there was a fear-based home that you lived in and all of a sudden you picked up on some fears in your life. Or maybe for some of you as you've just gone through life, like you've picked up fear along the way. Like life experiences have brought fear into your hearts. Maybe it's because of a difficult situation that you went through. Maybe it's because of a traumatic moment that you experienced or a painful moment that that you had. But as you've gone through life, you've, you've picked up a fear. And you begin to live your life in a way where you no longer want to experience that fear ever again or experience that moment ever again. So you do everything you can to make sure that it doesn't happen and you live with a little bit of fear. Maybe for some of you, because of the homes that you grew up in or the way things that you learned, you, you live with the fear of not having enough and, and do you have enough financial margin in your life and because of maybe the circumstances or a fear that you picked up, every time you go to spend something, you, you live with this fear of am I going to have enough and it could have been picked up in your childhood, it could have been picked up because of a moment that you experienced, but it's a fear that you live with. Maybe for some of you, you lost a loved one and, and when you remember that experience, it's like they went into the hospital one day and then they never came back out and you never fully understood it and, and it was a moment that all of a sudden gripped your heart and you live in a fear of the doctor's office or going to the doctor. Or for others, maybe you entered into a relationship and that relationship wasn't healthy and it, and it didn't go well and it, it didn't end right. And, and all of a sudden you lived out the pain of that one relationship and you picked up a fear and that keeps coming back every relationship that you walk into. So no matter who we are, all of us deal with a level of fear. And what happens is once we have experienced fear, we are walking with fear in our life, we begin to make decisions based on that fear. And that fear that we have will keep us from experiencing everything that God wants for us. That fear will put a weight on us. It'll put a heaviness on us. It will create a burden on us. And we will begin to make relational decisions through the lens of fear. We'll begin to make financial decisions through the lens of fear. And we will often even feel and sense God calling us to do something. And we will retreat and we will run away because of fear instead of moving forward because of faith. For some of you, it's the fear of failure that you deal with. And because of the fear of failure, you work 24 hours a day to try to get ahead so that nobody can look at you and say or call you a failure. And you find yourself sacrificing the things in life that that really matter the most. Because you have to be successful. You are afraid of failure. Or maybe you're a college student and you're killing yourself studying and and studying extra time and extra hours just to get one more percentage point because you are afraid of failure. And it's in these moments that Jesus tells us the words and says to us that, he says, take my yoke upon you. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You see, there's a lightness that God wants us to live in. There's a freedom that he wants us to experience in our life. But yet when we are gripped by fear, we don't have the ability to live in the freedom and the the fullness that God has called each and every one of us as followers to live and to walk in. And if we're not careful, we will allow fear to grip our hearts. And we will allow fear to drive us into a corner of isolation. And so we have to get this fear out of our life. We have to get this fear off of us. 
because there's so much more that God has for our life. And, and today, I just really want us to look at it. What does it look like to, to break the spirit of fear in our lives so that I can live in the fullness, I can live in the lightness, I can live in the abundance that Christ has for our life? Because every single one of us, as we go through life and we've experienced life, we pick up fear, and if we're not careful, it will grip our hearts, and it will keep us from the abundant life that Christ has for us. In the story that we looked at, we find David, and he's afraid. He's afraid for his life. Now you got to remember, this is King David. This is the David who killed a bear. This is the David who took down the lion. This is the David that sits in the valley and he looks at Goliath, the, the Philistine champion, with, a, with a, just a sling and a stone in his hand and he takes him down. That same David, we find him in the story, gripped with fear, overwhelmed with a fearful moment in his life. You see, for in this moment, David is not king at this point. The king of Israel is Saul. And David is the anointed king, but he is not there yet. And the Bible tells us that, that Saul hates David. He has a disdain for David. And all of a sudden, Saul wants to kill him. Jonathan is the son of Saul, but he's also the best friend of David. And Jonathan comes to David and he says, David, my father wants to kill you. Now, I don't know how your friendships went in life, but I don't know if any of your friend's parents wanted to kill you. But this is what's happening for David. Like Jonathan comes to him and like, hey, I know we're friends. I know we're tight. But guess what? My, my dad wants to kill you. And he wants to do it now. So you better leave as fast as you can. And you better get out of here if you want to spare your life. And so David does exactly that. He doesn't wait. He doesn't sit around and see what's going to happen. David just leaves. And when we pick up the story, David has fled, is fleeing from Saul. And he decides to go to him, uh, Ahimelech, the priest. And he shows up at his doorstep. And he's looking for assistance. He's looking for help. He shows up at the temple, at the home of the priest. And he says, hey, do you have any bread here? Like, is there anything we can, I can have for food? Because I'm going to need some food. I'm going to need some water to sustain me. And he shows up at his house. And, and the Bible says that Ahimelech looks at David and says, man, what, what's going on? What's wrong? And actually in this story, in the context of the story we read, David lies to Ahimelech. David lies to him and he says, I am on an urgent mission for the king. That's a lie. He's not on an urgent mission for the king. He is running from the king. And as you read this story, I just want to remind you today, that, that we need to be reminded that God uses imperfect people, right? Like, like, like this is the story all throughout the gospel. This is the story of David's life. Like he is lying in this moment and yet God does not just throw him out. Some would sit back and say, you know what? He should be justified for his lies because his life was in danger. But actually he pays the price later. There, there is a price to be paid for the lying that he does. But may we be reminded that God is not looking for perfect people. God is looking for people with a heart that's open to the things that God wants to do in them and through them. That God wants us just to come to him just as we are. And God still works through our lives. And so David lies to the priest. And then he looks at him and he says, hey, do you have a sword? Do you have a spear that's available to me? Like, like I was in such a hurry and, and this mission is so important that I forgot all of my weapons. And Ahimelech looks at David and says, the only thing I have is the sword that you left here. Now, if you don't remember the story, it's actually the, sto the sword of Goliath. That David, when he defeated Goliath, that the Bible tells us that he pulled out Goliath's sword and he cut the giant's head off. And David looks at the priest and he says, that one will do. <laughs> like, I'll take that one with me. Like, like I want that sword and let me just remind you today that the current battles that you are facing in life, like I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you're facing today. But the current battles that you are facing in life are the very things that will give you the confidence that you need to fight future battles in your life. 
Like, like you can't give up on the battle that you are in right now because when you win it, when you come out on the other side victorious, when you see the faithfulness of God, it will be the confidence builder that you need for all the future battles that you are going to face. That when you are able to overcome the situations that you are walking through in life, you will be able to look back over your life and you will be able to begin to declare and remember the goodness of God in your life. And it's what's going to give you the confidence to say, hey, there might be a little fear that's coming in my life, but guess what? I can remember how good my God is. I can remember how faithful my God is. That when all of a sudden you're a little fearful in life, maybe you can look back over your life and go, man, that time I was changed changing that job. I was a little fearful about what was going to happen, but God showed up. God gave me favor. God elevated me and everything worked out and you will remember the faithfulness of God in your life. Maybe there's going to be that time and you go, man, that was a hard season. This person walked out on me. They hurt me. My heart was broken, but man, it was God who sustained me. It was the Lord who healed my heart. It is going to be that moment of remembrance that's going to give you the strength to see you through the next battle that you go through in life maybe there's been a moment where you didn't have the provision that you needed and you didn't know where it was going to come from but God showed up God provided on your behalf it's in that moment that you remember the goodness of God in your life that's going to give you the strength to overcome whatever fear comes tomorrow you see the word of God says that he is the same yesterday today and forever and if he delivered you then he can deliver you now if he healed you then he can heal you now if he provided then he will provide now because that's who our God is and when we look back over our life and we look at the battles that we've gone through the situations that we've gone through in life we can begin to see a God who came through in the past and that same God will come through in the present that if you want to overcome fear you got to look over your past and remember the goodness of God you got to hold on to what God has done You got to pick up sometimes that sword like David did and go, man, this is the sword of Goliath. This is the one that when I took him down in that valley, that's the God that I serve. And remember the faithfulness of God. Now what I love about the Bible is the Bible is filled with real stories about real people. Like, I love how the Bible really doesn't just try to to paint a, a perfect image of the people that it's telling the stories about like David steps up on this thing and he and uh, the the priest is like I, I got the sword of Goliath and David's like give it to me like in the moment he's like yes like that's it man like I, I'm a warrior when I have that thing he's afraid of Saul and then he's like you know give me that sword like I, I remember what God did this sword is probably too big for him I mean, it was the sword of a giant. It was the sword of an individual that was like nine and a half feet tall. And here David's probably grabbing. He's like, give it to me. I'm going to take it. There's some courage that's coming in his life. But even in that moment of courage that David has, like where he's remembering the faithfulness of God, the Bible says that David left that place and he goes to the city of Gath. Now what you need to know is that the city of Gath was the Philistine city. It was actually the home of Goliath, the one that he defeated. And as he's entering into the city, the people of Gath have not forgotten about David. Like they they see him coming from afar off and they're like, isn't that David? Isn't that like the king? Like they, he wasn't king at the time, but they recognized him as king. And they're like, isn't that David? Isn't that the one? who slayed Goliath. And all of a sudden, you have this moment where David's gone from being afraid of Saul and running to the priests. Then you have this moment where he gets the sword of Goliath and he's like, I'll take that one. Remembering the goodness of God, remembering the faithfulness of God. And now he goes to the city of Gath. And what we find with David is he is so gripped with fear in this moment that the Bible says he starts acting like a madman, banging his head on a gate, allowing drool to run down his beard. And everything's changed. You see, you can have the memory of the goodness of God in one hand. 
and still be gripped with fear and scared to death at the same time. You can know with everything inside of you that God is good, that God is faithful, and yet fear can grip your heart at the same time. See, I often encounter people that think, you know, if I'm afraid, then I don't have faith. But even in the midst of your fear, you have faith. It's just misplaced faith. Like you can be afraid and have faith at the same time. It's just you're putting your faith in the wrong place. You're you're putting our faith and confidence in the negative things that may happen or what we think is going to happen. We start placing our faith and trusting in the worst outcomes living out the worst scenarios in our life, trusting the negativity that we're speaking over our lives more than we're trusting the God who created us and formed us and shaped us. And here's what happens in life, is when fear begins to grip your heart, you begin to make irrational decisions. And David shows up to Gath, And just going to the city was an irrational decision to start with. But he shows up to this place and is willing to be stripped of his dignity because of the fear that had gripped his life. And we have to understand when we allow fear to be present in our life, we make irrational decisions when we are afraid. We make irrational decisions when we are afraid. We are just like David. We will do things that we would normally not do when fear begins to control our circumstances in life. Think about it. If you've ever allowed fear to control your life or if you've had the fear of losing something, what we often find ourselves doing is making irrational decisions and because we're afraid of losing something, we find ourselves often trying to grab onto that thing that we're afraid of losing the most And we often find ourselves pushing people away further because of our fear of losing something in life. When we are afraid or have the fear of the unknown, we often find ourselves making irrational decisions and and we try to control the situations, we try to control the circumstances and and we try to do things in advance of the fear that we have because we don't know what the uh, we don't know what the future holds and because it's unknown, now we're going to try to become controlling in this situation and it drives us to irrational decisions. Because sometimes we deal with the fear of man, the fear of pleasing people and those that are around us. The book of Proverbs actually tells us the fear of man will prove to be a snare. That not to live in the fear of man, but to live with the fear of God. And so the Bible tells us that when we live with the fear of man, we will live our lives to please those that are around us. And what often happens is that we live our lives in contrast to what God has for us. Because I'm so worried about what other people think, I can't live my life to fully live it out for God. And because of the fear of man, we will make irrational decisions because we're afraid. And when we are driven by fear, we make our irrational decisions. And we find ourselves doing the same thing that King David did. We find ourselves acting insane. And so how did David, how did King David get the grip of fear off of him? Like if you read the rest of the text... What you find is this, is David goes from acting insane to leading 400 men. Like, like he went from an insane, drooling man banging his head on a fence to a valiant leader of men. Like how did David go from one place to the next? How did he get the grip of fear off of him? And step into the full calling that God God had over his life. I want to look at three things actually. That are found in Psalms 34. That I believe is the same three things that we can do in our life. To get the grip of fear off of us. You see Psalms 34 was written. As a psalm. When David was in this situation. When David was acting insane. And so the Bible tells us that when they would show up, he would act insane. When they would leave, he would be normal. It doesn't tell us how long he was in their care. He doesn't tell us how long he was in Gath. 
whether it was a long time or a few hours. But the Bible says that when they would show up, he'd start banging his head, drooling at the mouth. When they would leave, he, 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 his insanity was back. And it was in the moments of this situation in his life that he writes Psalms 34. And in Psalms 34, I think we find some keys of how we too get the grip of fear off of our life or to help us overcome the fear that we've experienced. So here's how Psalms 34 reads. It says, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will, say it with me, say always. His praise will always be on my lips. I will boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. How do we get the grip of fear off of our life? How do we overcome fear? The first thing that we see about David is this, is he, he's, he's talked about the Lord. We have to talk about the Lord. We have to talk about the Lord. Like David finds himself in this place where he's gripped with fear. And David just begins to change the internal dialogue in his mind. Like fear will run the internal dialogue of your mind if you allow it. And it will take you to places in your life that are not reality. And it will take you to to places where you are just spiraling down all the scenarios that could happen. Like have you ever been there? If you're not careful, fear will control the internal dialogue in your life. You'll, you'll begin to think things like this. Well, well, if I have that conversation and I talk to this person and, and I share these things with them, then, then this is going to happen and, and that's going to happen. And all of a sudden your mind goes to a place and you are down a rabbit's hole and you are having conversations and thinking about things that you had never thought that you could happen. But all of a sudden fear is just controlling the dialogue in your mind. For some of you, fear controls the internal dialogue of your mind and you think you're fearful of what's going to happen to your kids. And you're like, whoa, 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 if I I let them go hang out with their friends and if I let them go down here, like somebody's going to kidnap them and they're going to steal them from me. And, And it's like, no, no, they're going to see a movie. Don't let the fear control the internal dialogue in your mind. And so the way that David overcame that is he says, you know what? I'm not going to boast about the negativity that's going on around me, but David says, I'm going to boast in the Lord. Like if you are gripped by fear, if you are dealing with fear in your life, you have to change the internal dialogue of your mind. You have to start boasting about the Lord. Like what does this word boast mean? It means to make much of, to put at the forefront. Like, like, I'm going to boast about the Lord in my life. Like, I am going to, to put him at the center. I'm going to make much of the God that I serve. I'm going to declare that he is highly exalted in my life, that he's the king of kings, that, that he is the Lord of lords. Like, like I'm going to make a lot about the Lord that I serve. I'm going to begin to declare that, guess what? If he's the God that could part the Red Sea, then when I'm standing in front of something that seems like a, an ocean too big to cross, guess what? If he did it then, he can do it now. Like, I'm going to talk about the greatness of my God. I'm going to talk about the fact that if he could provide manna for them in the desert and the food that they needed for their life, and if he could sustain them then, then guess what? He is the same God. And when there's provision that's needed in my life, he's the same God that can sustain me right here and right now. That he is the same God that opened blinded eyes, that, that made the lame to walk. And guess what? If I'm sick in my body, it is the same God that can do it for me, that did it back then, because he's the same yesterday yesterday, today, and forever. What am I doing? I'm talking about the Lord. Like I'm boasting about the God that I serve. I'm making his name great. If you want to change the internal dialogue in your mind, you got to start talking about the Lord. Here's the problem, is we often go around life boasting about our fears instead of talking about the Lord. Have you ever asked somebody, well, how are you doing today? Oh, it's bad. It's really, really bad. Like, I don't know. The world's just gonna, it's just all coming down. It's it, like, I don't know what to do. And you just begin to talk about all the negative stuff and you begin to, to boast about your fears and about the struggles that you're going through. Now, don't misunderstand me today. You need some close people in your life to pour your heart out to. That's why I want to encourage you to get in groups and be involved in, in some good community around you. 
But you gotta stop boasting about the fear that you're dealing with in life. Well, this is never gonna happen that way and that's never gonna happen. I'm never gonna have this relationship and I'm gonna die, I'm gonna die all alone and, and my kids are never gonna succeed in this and I'm never gonna get this job and I'm never and I'm never and I'm gonna never and ever. And we're just talking and boasting about all the things that we're afraid of. But let me just remind you, like who are you to get the final say in your life? Like God gets the final say. God gets to be the one who speaks things into your life. And so when fear begins to grip our hearts, we have to do what David said. He says, guess what? I will praise him always. His, his praise will always be on my lip. I will boast in the Lord. I'm going to talk about my God. And then in verse 3, he just says, hey, let us exalt his name together. David says, let's do this together. Like, let's not do this alone. Let's, let's exalt and let's boast in the Lord together. So David tells us, guess what? You should make sure you're around some other people in your life that's boasting about the Lord. That, that's talking about the Lord. Like, like, stop accepting the invitation to the pity party of your life and start getting around some people that are also boasting about the Lord so you can exalt his name together. And so you better start surrounding yourself with people who are declaring Making known, talking highly of, putting at the forefront of our life the things that God is doing. You want to get over the, overcome fear in your life? You better start talking about the Lord. He goes on in Psalms 34, and he would say this, I sought the Lord, and he answered me. He delivered me from all, look at this, I sought hit the Lord, he answered me, and he delivered me from what? All my, my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. David says, I sought him. He delivered me from my fears. And he got me out of all the trouble that I was in in this moment. So not only do I need to talk about the Lord, the second thing you can write down is this. Is I need to seek the Lord. I need to seek the Lord. Like, I gotta, I gotta now, I, I'm talked about the Lord, but now I need to seek after the Lord. I need to call upon the Lord. I need to just begin to open my heart to him. I need to come to God and say, God, I, I'm scared. Like, God, I, I'm, I'm afraid of what's going on in my life. I'm afraid of the outcomes that are all around me. And here's what you need to know is that God already knows what you're fearful of. Like God already knows the fear that you're dealing with in your heart and in your life. But here's the truth. There is power in confessing those things to him. You're like, well, Aaron, he already knows my fears. He already knows my struggles. But I'm going to seek the Lord. I'm going to confess them to him. Because here's the assumption in confession. This is why confession is so powerful. That when we confess something to God, the assumption in confessing these things to him is that he has the power to do something about them. So when I say, God, I, I'm fearful about this situation. I'm fearful about the outcome of my life. God, I'm fearful about what's happening in my finances. I'm fearful about what's happening in my relationships. I'm fearful about what's happening in my family. Like when I confess those things to God, what I'm saying is, God, I'm telling you these things because I'm starting with the assumption that God, you can do something about this. That God, that you can turn this all around. So God, I'm running to you. Like, I'm not running to, to my best friend for advice. I'm not running to, to this individual in my life. I'm not running to this person or to, to Google or to the internet to try to find the answers. God, I'm coming to the one that I believe can do something about this. And so David says, guess what? I'm going to seek the Lord. And he says, when I sought the Lord, he answered me. And he delivered me from all my fears. And he saved me from all of my troubles. So you want to overcome fear? Boast about the Lord. Declare the greatness of Him. Put Him front and center of your life. Seek the Lord. Ask Him. Tell Him what's on your heart. Tell Him about the fears that you're dealing with. 
And then David gives us one more thing. Psalms 34, 7 through 9. It says, the, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. The angel of the Lord encamps himself. I'm always praying over my boys at night. Father, just camp your angels around them. Keep them and guard them. Well, how does that happen? They encamp around those who fear not the things of this world, but fear him. And not in that same way of trembling or like, oh, I'm so fearful of God, like I got to cower before him. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. No, no, in this way, it's like, God, you're awesome. You're amazing. What, what does that sound like? Fearing of him is boasting about him in a way that in acts that his angels and camps themselves around us. And here's what it says, those who fear him and he delivers them. Then verse 8, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his holy people. For those who aren't afraid of the things of this world, but those who have a fear of God, guess what? They lack nothing. Like those whose eyes are so fixed, on Jesus. Those whose eyes are so fixed on the power and the greatness and the might of our God. That when our eyes are fixed on him, all this stuff the enemy puts in front of you, you won't have your time to fix your eyes on those things because my eyes are fixed on him. So what's the last thing that David tells us to do? He says, you need to try the Lord. You need to try the Lord. David says, I've tasted and seen that the Lord is good. And I lack nothing. I've tried him. Like I've tried him in the middle of my doubts. I tried him. In the middle of my fear, like I, I tried God. Like when everything is falling apart, like I've tried him. I've tasted that the Lord is good. And because of that, I lack nothing. Can I tell you something? God wants you to lack nothing. Like that's what he has for your life. So what does it look like to try the Lord? What does it look like to taste and see that the Lord is good? It looks like when fear begins to grip your hearts, and yet God is telling you to take the step. Trying the Lord is I'm going to take the step. I'm afraid, but I'm going to taste and see that the Lord is good. It's the moment where you feel like God is urging you to have a conversation, but you're fearful of, of how that conversation is going to go, and you're afraid, and, and you start having all of these things come in your head, like, well, we're going to have this conversation, and then they're never going to talk to me again, and it's going to hurt this relationship, and, and we're just going to spiral out of control, and, and all of a sudden fear has gripped your heart, but yeah, it's what you feel like God's calling you to do. Guess what you need to do? You just need to engage the conversation. You need to taste and see. Or when you're tempted to hold on to something, because you're afraid of giving up control in your life and God's saying, hey, I want you to walk by faith in this area of your life. Guess what? You just need to do it. You just need to taste and see that the Lord is good. Or maybe you're tempted to not try something because you're afraid of failure in your life. But you know this is what God is asking you to do. Then guess what it looks like? It just looks like I'm going to go and do it. And I'm going to taste and see that the Lord is good. So when fear begins to, to settle in, when fear begins to seep into your heart and into your life, what are we going to do? I'm going to talk about the Lord. I'm going to boast about the Lord. I'm going to talk about how faithful and powerful and mighty he is. I'm going to remember the goodness of God in my life, and I'm going to boast about those things of how he's delivered me and saved me and, and sustained me through hard times and dark times and difficult moments of life. And I'm going to put him at the forefront and the center of everything that I do. I'm going to seek the Lord. I'm going to confess my fears to him because in seeking him, I'm, I'm giving him the, 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 the notion and I'm telling him, God, I know that you can do something about this. And then I'm going to try the Lord. I'm going to taste and see that the Lord is good. For when I do so, I, then I lack nothing in life. 
And so can I tell you and remind you, God doesn't want you to live in fear. He wants you to live in freedom. And fear is the opposite of freedom in our life. But God wants us fully alive, fully free to step into the destiny that he has for us. And so whatever you're dealing with today, whatever areas of your life that fear has got a stronghold on, just do what David did. Just do what David did. Talk about the Lord. Seek the Lord. And try the Lord. Would you stand to your feet with me this morning?